All right. Thank you, everyone, for uh, for joining us for this evening's talk. My name is Charles Epting from HR Harmer in New York City. And I'm Michael Cortese of Noble Spirit in Pittsfield, New Hampshire. Tonight, we're going to be hearing from George James. Now, George first started dealing in stamps while at university in The Hague, a passionate philatelist with more than a decade's worth of training under his belt. Uh, most recently, he won a large gold medal for his exhibit of Salon Foreign Bill Revenues at 2019 Autumn Stamp X. And George is going to be talking about dangerous forgeries and how to spot them. So Stanley Gibbons has been purchasing dangerous forgeries and removing them from philatelic, the philatelic marketplace for over a century and today holds one of the most comprehensive reference collections of forged stamps anywhere in the world. Head of Commonwealth George James, supported by illustrations and some of the most dangerous examples, will show you what makes them so dangerous, how to spot them, and how this should affect your collecting habits. So without further ado, uh, we'll uh, give the floor to uh, George James. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm just going to check you can all uh, see my screen OK. Um, are, we, uh, are we good, Michael and Charles? Looks great to us. We can see everything perfect. Good. Great. OK, just need to check. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, it was a thanks for the intro, guys. Um, and thanks for the invitation. It's really nice to be here. I uh, hope everyone's enjoying virtual Stampex. Um, so I'm just going to sort of uh, run through what we're going to cover um, tonight. Um, so um, the reason this is so important um, for the market, um, particularly Stanley Gibbons, is because as a dealer, this is one of the hardest uh, conversations you have to have with a philatelist is when they come to sell their collection or parts of it, if you have to say to a collector, uh, that's a forgery, or you know, there's a problem with that that wasn't known when you purchased it, it's often a really hard conversation and it, um, it leads to people losing money and it, it, puts, it can put people off for that thing, um, in the worst case scenario. So it's important that people uh, know what they're buying and are, and are as clued up as they possibly can be about what they're buying. Um, so we're gonna cover pretty much everything tonight. Now I'll start by saying this is not a talk about fly specs. I'm not going to go through, you know, this line is how you identify this particular country and you've just got to wait for your country to show up. We're not going to go sort of A to Z. Uh, what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to try um, to make it as, ge as general as possible. Uh, so even if you don't collect Commonwealth, um, you should pick up something useful tonight because the um, the tips and the examples we're going to see, yes, they are Commonwealth stamps, because that's, that's my job and that's what Stanley gives himself. Um, but it should apply um, more broadly in the methods and uh, how to look out for them um, is, is what we're going to try and cover. So the idea is to get, get the procedures in your head uh, when you're looking at stamps, you know, whether it's retail, auction, uh, you know, on eBay, wherever it is, uh, get the procedure in your head for spotting fakes. Uh, of all types before they end up in your album. So let's, uh, let's start um, with Stanley Gibbons. Um, so Charles Nissen, or Chaz Nissen as he was known, uh, was one of the uh, early directors um, of Stanley Gibbons. Uh, and he wrote a book in 1906. Um, and he estimated that in, as of 1906, uh, 3,000 British pounds had been spent purchasing just reference forgeries. Now, accounting for inflation only in today's money, that's £373,000 in today's money. And now since 1906, that collection has only ever been added to. Um, it's, it's only grown uh, with the exception of the foreign collection. And when I say foreign, I mean Europe and South America. Um, some examples of those were disposed in the 80s and 90s, but the Commonwealth has just grown and grown and grown. Uh, and all the original... Um, or well, the original books that were written and put together by Major Evans, who was a very early uh, esteemed philatelist, they're all still housed in the vault at 399 Strand in London. Uh, so the Commonwealth, the core of it, uh, is in 10 uh, beautifully written up A to Z volumes, which um, the retail team, my team, uh, uses, uses almost daily. Um, references, runs A to Z, um, and it shows you know, printings, papers, cancellations, everything you could ask for. Um, now, if you want to learn more about the reference collection, Stanley Gibbons um, have a YouTube channel and we post regularly. Um, and I've done a whole separate talk on the uh, reference collection, how it was formed, there's pictures of it there. 
um, and, and how we use it. So the key for us, and the reason this is so important for Stanley Gibbons, uh, is in the GB and Commonwealth retail departments, we have a absolute uh, no quibble lifetime guarantee on every single thing we sell. So when you consider um, certificates, uh, when you consider extensions, um, they're fine. They give very accurate, um, very accurate, you know, opinions, um, but they aren't a financial guarantee. So if I sell a stamp, um, and 50 years from now, uh, someone comes back and can say, "I can prove this is a forgery," Stanley Gibbons will refund it. Um, and in fact, the only refund I've ever done from Commonwealth Department in 10 years was a Tonga stamp, uh, which Stanley Gibbons sold in 1978. Um, and then new research in 2003 uh, proved it to be a forgery. So at the time it was sold, it was sold entirely in good faith and it was believed they were genuine at the time. Uh, in 2003, um, it was discovered they were fakes and then it came back onto my desk last year um, and we uh, issued a full refund straight away, adjusted for inflation. Um, so this is why we have such a good reference collection. Um, it's also why my job is such, such a challenge because if you're going to put someone on the card, you've got to be absolutely uh, absolutely certain of what it is and that, it, that it's not a fake. Um, so it's, it's the reason people come to us. Um, no waiting for certificates, no waiting for extensions. Um, if it's on a GB retail card or a Commonwealth retail card, it's exactly what it says on the tin, to use a, a British cliche. Um, so let's start um, with, uh, well, all these items with the exception of two, which I'll mention, are items uh, from the Stanley Games reference collection. Um, so these have all been permanently removed from the market and can never be offered. Um, once, once they come into the Stanley Gibbons reference collection, um, they can't get into your collection, which is a, a good thing for everyone, really. Uh, so I'll run you through. Um, what, so re-gumming is, uh, is the first one. Um, now, re-gumming is probably... It's probably up there with the most common forgeries you see. Um, certainly in Commonwealth, I'm sure it spans um, a large number of countries. Um, now, the stamp on the left of the screen um, is regunned, and the stamp on the right of the screen with the hinge remainder isn't. Now, these are the same stamp, the same issue, um, and there's certain indicators already. Now, gum is particularly hard to uh, get across in a scan on a PowerPoint over Zoom. Uh, the best way to actually um, to view gum is to rake light across the face of it. So if you're ever checking if something's unmounted um, or for gum condition, raking light across the face is almost always the best uh, way to do it. Uh, now the first warning signs with the stamp on the right are, and again, this is hard to see on the uh, uh, on this scan, but the, the re-gumming uh, for Commonwealth stamps in particular tends to soak into the paper. Uh, so straight away, um, it looks it looks different. Um, and now we'll go to the next slide, which you'll see. Uh, now, when stamps are separated from the sheet, when you when you separate a stamp from the sheet, the gum is already on it. Um, and the key thing about that uh, is that you get soft paper fibers with no gum on them. So the, the this is a close up of the two stamps on the last page. So the lower stamp, I realize it's uh, it's going across Zoom and PowerPoint, so I can see it's slightly blurry, but you can see these tiny paper fibers are free of gum because they had no gum on them at the point at which it was separated from the sheet. Now the top stamp, you can see uh, at the tip of the purse, those same paper fibers are coated in gum. Um, and this is because at the point it's been regummed, it's all soaked in. And this is why you often see dealers um, and collectors alike, uh, just uh, running their things along the edge of the purse. Um, Regum stamps tend to feel um, almost sharp, um, much harder, um, and they feel completely different to, uh, to normal stamps. Um, now, other indicators are if you hold a stamp and you put it face down in your hand, uh, there's often a unnatural pearl to it. So a genuine stamp and a regum stamp uh, the regum often shrinks uh, afterwards. So you tend to find that it starts to curl up in your hand under any kind of heat. Um, other indicators are sometimes you get marks under the gum. So this is particularly true where someone's tried to make, um, <clears throat> excuse me, where someone's tried to make a mountain stamp unmounted. Um, at the time the gum was applied, 
um, the mark, the hinge mark will have gone, but then sometimes over time it comes back. So if you can see a mark under the gum, it's a huge warning sign. Um, so we've covered gum soaked into a watermark. Um, the other thing to consider, and this is going to be a theme throughout tonight, is uh, whether it's an opportunity or not. Um, so if there's a huge premium for unmounted stamps, as there is in a lot of countries across, across the world, um, and they're widely available mounted, uh, it's your first warning sign. Uh, forgers always uh, take opportunities uh, where available uh, to improve stamps and make some money. Um, so the, the stamps we saw across on the last two slides are this stamp from, from Grenada, uh, which actually only catalogs eight pounds. Um, but this is the big problem with regumming is once you're set up, um, uh, there's, I know for a fact they're done with uh, sprays, they're done with paint, paint brushes, the, the reapplied gum that is. Um, it's, it's pretty easy to set up an industrial operation once, once you've started, um, which is a huge problem. But the good news is it's very, very detectable. Um, and the key thing is to know what gum on your stamp should look like. Um, so it's hard to give tips um, for all across all across the Commonwealth. You know, stamp production has changed massively over 150 years, and some some gum is usually brown, and some gum is usually pristine white. So I'm not going to give you tips on specific things, but you always need to know uh, what uh, the, the gum on a stamp should look like. So you can say within a set. Um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's just the best way to do it. Um, Moving on, uh, postmarks. Again, uh, this is a huge opportunity uh, for forgers. Um, it tends to be stamped with poor gum, um, mounted stamps in the case of Georgia Sick. Uh, so you've got this Fort Malone stamp here. Um, now I hear from, from older traders that the, private, the practice was pretty rife in the past. Um, and again, this tends to particularly affect places where usage was small. So in Commonwealth, uh, you're talking um, small islands with low population, uh, stamps which didn't see much use or are very difficult to find used, um, and anywhere where the rarity of used stamps to mint is greater. Again, if there's an opportunity there, the forger, someone, someone's going to have had a go at it, and there are going to be forgeries on the market. Um, if you're forming a used collection, uh, the most important thing for Commonwealth in particular is to only collect stamps with identifiable postmarks. It has been so easy throughout history and even today to add a tiny part ring in a corner um, of a damaged mint stamp. Um, and they have been, you will see them at every single stamp that you go to. Um, my advice would be to not regard them as suitable for your collection. You need to see that. Um, you know, a stamp has been used uh, where it was issued. Otherwise, it's, you know, frankly, it's just, if you can't prove it's genuine, you've got to regard it as a fake. Um, so we'll go with uh, this stamp on the right, this lovely Fort Myers five shilling, a uh, beautiful stamp. Um, now, Fox Bay is a small outlying island in the Fort Myers Islands. Um, and this stamp uh, has had a fake postmark applied. Um, now, we started with one of the crudest forgeries of uh, postmarks and this is actually done uh, with a home printer. Now I'm going to zoom in and then you'll be able to see exactly how it's done. Uh, now you can see uh, the um, almost like a shadow behind the black, excuse me, and this is because this has been done with CMYK uh, printer ink. So you get the cyan uh, and you can see the um, basically the black from a printer is made up of yellow, um, uh, yellow, green, and, and red, and it all merges together. And the blue and green that you can see behind the A there, the red you can see behind the bay, the, sorry, the B in bay. Uh, this is basically where the printer has not registered it correctly. So almost whenever you see this, um, this is hugely crude, but they're always going to be fake. They are not cancels that have been done with a, a genuine implement. Um, but again, if we go back to the other scanner, at a glance, it can look semi-plausible. Um, and this accounts for a lot of the fakes you see um, on eBay is simple inkjet ones. Um, so they're, they're definitely ones to look out for when it comes to use sounds, particularly from, from rare uh, destinations. Um, so this is another um, 
it's another example of where the opportunity is just too great and it's Indian Convention States. So what we're looking at here is uh, two stamps from the Indian Convention States. Uh, we're looking at 069 and 070 um, from Chamber. Now, the reason these are so susceptible uh, to fakery is these stamps hardly saw any usage or if there was usage, they're exceptionally rare and so few have survived. So in mint condition, these two stamps catalog 42 pounds and 60 pounds respectively. Uh, yet in used condition, uh, they catalog 900 pounds and 950 pounds. Um, so we're talking massive multiples in terms of value, in terms of rarity for used. Um, so for that reason, almost as soon as they were listed, uh, people have been trying to fake these. Um, these. These two are absolute fakes, which we've uh, removed from the market. Um, and we see, I estimate, probably 80% plus of the used examples of high value convention states material that appears on the market uh, has fake postmarks. So um, if you're collecting these, uh, always buy with a certificate or a suitable guarantee, um, because you'll see in the next slide uh, that they, uh, uh, the Indian convention states, this is slightly later towards the SIP, but uh, they use these hooded, uh, with the hooded types of CDS. So these two are genuine. Um, these two stayed in stock for about eight tenths of a second when we got them in, um, as convention states always do. Um, but it's just, you need to know uh, what a genuine cancel looks like um, before you buy. So again, similar to the gum, um, make sure you have reference material, make sure you have a picture in your mind of doing it. And above all, if you don't, that's fine, but you need a suitable guarantee or you need a suitable certificate. Um, now, fake postmarks like these are probably the most common thing we see. And this, this, this particularly affects people with printed albums, um, people who buy mixed lots um, at auction. Um, collectors are naturally optimistic, and I'll include myself in that, um, and just hope it's genuine. Um, but then the only thing is it just leads to massive disappointment, um, when, either when you come to sell or, you know, when you find out later along the line or you want to exhibit it because uh, you know if you're exhibiting a judge would, would would know that these are these are fake cancels so um again keep an eye out um and particularly this is the most important thing where there's huge incentive uh so we're talking 42 pounds to 960 pounds to 950 where that incentive is there and it's simple someone will have tried it and it's a sad fact of life um but again um, if you've got your wits about you, these are quite these are fairly easy to spot. Um, so we go on now to the most famous um, of all the fake postmark forgers, which is Madame Joseph. Now, many of you watching will know already, um, but Madame Joseph was probably probably a non de plume. Um, but it was a dealer active from the 30s to at least the late 1950s, um, who engaged in wholesale. Uh, production of fake cancellations. Um, now, it's all um, almost rumours and hearsay. Uh, a lot of research has gone into this. Um, now, the, the almost cartel of dealers who were doing this, uh, they were based in London uh, on Lime Street. Um, but uh, the re there's a French connection um, because some of the more complex um, work they seem to have subcontracted to uh, to France, um, which is where the sort of Madame Joseph name comes from. Um, it all came out uh, in the end, and luckily today um, these are safe. These cancels are safe uh, and off the market in the RPSL Museum here in London. Um, the problem, though, for the market is that they still trade regularly to this day. So they're, they're still on the market, um, still, yeah, still often seen. Um, this is what they look like. Um, so there were three types. Um, they were hand carved in wood, um, which is a, a skill level which is fairly remarkable, as you'll see. Um, they're really quite impressive. Um, other ones are made uh, of what are called zincographs, which are basically what they used to use for printing blocks back in the day. Um, so they're sort of almost like copper plates. Um, 
and they were sort of produced with a, a lithographic process in reverse. Um, now, in general, the, these were of a very, very, um, uh, yeah, I mean, a pretty high standard, um, which is why everyone was so delighted when they were taken off the market um, and why, why it's a relief that um, there's so much research done about them now. Um, so if you're collecting used Commonwealth then you're, and you're serious about it, um, I'm, I apologise for the blurry scan, but this is this is the crucial book you need, and this is this uh, Madame Joseph Revisited book, um, which is actually done by a former Stanley Gibbons employee, Brian Cartwright. Um, and there is a complete reference work um, with all the known types. Uh, now, the good news about them being wood um, and being copper and being zincographs is that generally the date couldn't change. There are some examples where they've made a hole to change the date, but in the vast majority of cases, uh, the dates are known. Uh, and so if you have the Madame Joseph book and you know Six of Jam, for instance, is the Madame Joseph, you can look it up and it's relatively easy to spot them. Um, the, other, the, uh, the other good way to spot Madame Joseph, uh, if we go here. Now this, this I actually, these are not standing image reference examples, but I actually point this from a recent auction. Um, the reason I the reason I poached it is because it is such a good example um, of um, one of the distinguishing features of Man and Joseph. So the, the two and six and the pound, uh, the postmarks are fine. And the way to tell that, um, well, not, not specifically, but you can see compared to the Man and Joseph, there's this thick black line. So if you look at the pound particularly uh, on the outside. And compare it to the outside ring of the five shilling penguin, which has a Madame Joseph cancellation. You can see that the cancellation ink of the Madame Joseph on the penguin uh, is almost grey. It's almost much more watery. Uh, the ink doesn't sit so well. Um, and this is simply because the Madame Joseph ones weren't produced with proper postmarking ink as they had um, back in the day. Um, or, or it wasn't produced with suitable ink and it didn't match. So often when you see high value. Um, use stamps um, with these cancellations and if they're slightly great it's a big warning sign it's not definitive but it's a huge warning sign so again when we look at look at the pounds and see the black ring on the outside and compare it to the gray ring straight away if you see this image you should be thinking ah that's a great cancel i'd better check it out now i'm going to show you now an extract from uh, the madame joseph book uh, this is a page from Brian Cartwright's book, and you can see straight away it's made of wood, um, 6th of January 1933. Uh, and then you compare it to the cancellation here, Port Stanley, Falkland Islands, and it's dated the 6th of January. So you can prove straight away because it's a wooden cancel, can't change the date, um, that it's that and it's used in 1933. Um, so again, it's an example of how you need to have the literature um, specifically for what you collect. Um, and again, if you if you're collecting used Commonwealth, that Madame Joseph book is absolutely essential. Um, next up, we're going to go and have a look at these uh, removed fiscal councils. Um, there's a lot of areas where they're susceptible, uh, particularly Australian states. Australian state stamps saw far more usage um, from a revenue perspective and from fiscal documents than they ever saw postally. Uh, the values. Are therefore reflected on the rarity that posts are better uh, and mint are better. Um, so it is absolutely rife on mint, um, mint Australian state stamps, early ones, and even what appear to be uh, postmarked um, Australian state stamps. Um, they're also often used on dual purpose revenue and postage stamps. Um, so essentially, like the Salon stamp we see here. Um, 100 rupees was naturally an enormous poster rate. Um, I don't know what you'd have to be posting from Salon to get to 100 rupees in, in the 1930s. It'd be sort of an elephant special delivery or something ludicrous that wasn't even on the charts. Um, so they're very, very, uh, we don't even list the price uh, standing in for the postal use of these. Um, and they were often cancelled with green crayon. Um, so in instances like this, where someone can create a rarity um, by essentially bleaching out a, a fiscal cancellation, they're going to try it. Um, so I'll show, show you uh, the bleaching affects the colour in almost all cases. So you've got what the stamp looks like um, 
you know, nice, fresh mint. Uh, and on the left, you've got this completely faked one. Um, so these uh, revenue stamps of Salon were often cancelled with a green crayon. Um, and uh, depending on your screen size, you might be able to trace just the very faintest uh, trace of that green crayon going vertically up, um, you know, past the, past the king's ear. Um, the other thing to spot is the, uh, the vignette and the royal portrait are completely the wrong colour. They're very faded, they're very washed. Uh, and that's purely because of the chemicals that have been used to remove uh, the green mark. Um, now, that is a big indicator on mint stamps is that the colour's not right. Um, the impression's not right. Um, you get this fading. It looks very strange on the ultraviolet light. Um, but then we get to this, frankly, pretty ludicrous postmark on this one, um, where it just doesn't resemble um, a, ge a genuine at all. The three in particular, and thirty, and it's uh, it's nothing. It's nothing like it. Um, so it's, it's quite a. It's a pretty crude attempt, but it's a good example of how how bleaching affects the colour. Um, this is a lot better now, and this is also why it's particularly ripe on uh, Australian state stamps, uh, is when you clean a fiscal, um, some of you might remember the uh, fountain pen removers that you could get in school, it leaves a little yellow mark um, when, when you remove a fiscal, uh, pet, uh, a fiscal mark um, because of the chemicals that are used fundamentally. They're, almost, almost, they're often sort of fountain pen inks. Um, and it leaves this little yellow trace. Now, this um, Rhodesia doublehead uh, has been fiscally used. It's then been cleaned or partially cleaned, as you'll see, um, of the fiscal cancel. Uh, and it's then had fake, um, fake CDSs applied. Um, so there's a sort of, there's a, there's a double, double side to this fake. Um, now, have a look before I change over and see if you can spot the trace of um, the traces of the ink. There's two key ones. Um, so I'm going to swap over. So there it is. Between, underneath the, the left value tablet of the pound, you can see just a trace of that purple ink where they tried to cover up with a postmark and then missed. But if you, follow, um, if you follow that purple line diagonally down to the right um, towards the crown of the queen, you can see this little almost brownish yellow remainder. And that is, um, that is a consistent theme across stamps that have had ink cancels removed, is it leaves this brown residue. Um, now, the darker and more dense the design of the stamp, the more difficult that this is to see. Um, but this is almost always visible under ultraviolet light. So any, any good stamp accessory shop um, or even print shops actually have can sell uh, ultraviolet lights. Um, and when you put stamps like this uh, under ultraviolet light, um they're they're very very visible um and it's, it's frankly the best way to spot them uh, the other trace of uh ink before we move on here um is in the lower margin under the a of rhodesia uh there's a tiny little uh brown spot in the margin again that's a, just a little speck of ink um where it's been been removed from the design so under the a of rhodesia slightly diagonally right um, between the lower margin and the bottom of the design, you've got that tiny little speck, but that again uh, is removed cancellation. Um, again, we discuss opportunity. The power and Rhodesia saw pretty extensive, the power and double heads saw pretty ex extensive um, fiscal use um, and nicely cancelled is very, very rare. So again, you've got that incentive, you've got that opportunity. Someone's going to try it at some stage, unfortunately. Um, we move on. Now this this um, this is a bit of a painful story for me. This 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 is housed in the um, Stanley Evans Records collection. It's a direct result um, of a mistake that I made early on in my career. Uh, my colleague Philip Kins has never let me forget this one. Um, as some of you know, um, I have an absolute passion for revenue stamps. It's what I collect. It's what I exhibit. It's what I study. Um, you know, you know, for work and uh, pleasure. Um, and the £75 um, Rhodesia fiscally used is an enormous rarity. Um, I think I've only seen, um, I think I've only seen four or five of these in my career. It's by far the rarest value in the set. It's actually rarer than the £100 used because it's a funny rate. Um, and uh, it catalogues £4,500 as a specimen. 
um, and £3,750 fiscally used. Uh, and in the 10 to 10 years that I've been a professional flats list, I've seen maybe three or four uh, genuinely used. And this was the first one. Um, now, because um, for a mint stamp, it's a massive rarity and hugely expensive. We're talking tens and tens and tens of thousands of pounds. Uh, as a specimen, it's four and a half thousand pounds. It didn't enter my head that this could be a fake. Um, and I was so excited and I bought it and uh, I bought the collector who also didn't know uh, and got it back to the office. And while I've been waffling on, I'm sure you've been inspecting it and thinking what's wrong. Um, but actually, when you have a look, I thought it was this cancel. This is one of my favorite items I've ever sold. Uh, this is a unique block of four uh, of the top value in the set. And what I thought this was at the time uh, when I purchased it from a collector was a blurred example of this registra registra bleh, registrar of these cancel. Um, now, these stamps were used for massive land transfer in Kenya. Um, there were companies building railways across the country uh, leasing, you know, thousands and thousands of miles of land from the government. The tax was paid uh, generally with these stamps. Um, what had actually happened with this stamp was if you look at the exact positioning of the cancel, it's almost exactly where the specimen would be. And what someone had done is they've had a rather grotty specimen example, probably with no gum or damaged gum. Uh, maybe it had some sort of, sort of other condition faults and they've They've worked out basically that if, uh, you know, these are today's catalog values, but if, if the specimen catalogs for four and a half thousand pounds, it's got no gum and it's damaged, it's going to be worth, you know, two thousand pounds. If they can create a used one, um, which is a, a massive rarity, um, you're going to get three thousand seven hundred fifty pounds because you don't need, um, you don't need the gum, you don't need the condition so much with a with a revenue stamp because if there's only well with this revenue stamp because if there's only three or four known um you're just going to trust it and it shows that even with massively rare stamps um even when i thought i was safe i absolutely wasn't and uh that cancel actually completely uh covers up the specimen um it's actually very difficult to show in powerpoint and it's actually extremely difficult to see in real life uh, but again in that same way we discussed with breaking the gum course if you rate like across the front of it the bit where specimen has almost been scraped off the surface becomes visible where the surface of the paper has been disturbed. Um, apart from that, um, I promise you that specimen is there, but as you can all see, it is extremely difficult to see. Um, so even though it's blurred and I should have been, I should have been sharper. Uh, I'd like to think I am sharper nowadays. Um, but uh, yeah, that, was, uh, that remains in the reference collection today. Uh, and will never again be sold, thank goodness. Um, the other aspect um, of cancellation cover-ups, um, this is particularly right in um, uh, Great Britain, where, for example, the five pound orange, uh, bar obliterators are often used to cover um, specimen examples. Uh, postally used stamps are rarer than specimens generally, uh, the GB high value, so you need to be particularly cautious with this. And it is in the exact same methodology. It is a big, thick, smudgy cancel. The smudgier, the better, covering up a specimen mark that's maybe been partially removed. Um, but they're 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 super dangerous. Um, but often, if you're on the lookout, um, they're quite easy to spot. I just didn't. I just I did not predict it. Um, from three or four in my uh, in my youth. <laughs> right, so we move on. Uh, doctored covers. Now, covers and postal history. Um, frankly, um, I put more opportunity for shenanigans uh, for forgers, and that's absolutely the case. Um, often, you can fundamentally you can add stamps um, to add a rarity to a cover. Um, you can, if the stamp falls off, you can try and remove trace of that cancel so it looks like it's an original rate, an original cover. Um, and then if the stamp falls off, uh, people try and replace the stamps um, with non-original stamps. Um, so again, consider the opportunity. If something's uprated or a combination franking, uh, is it hugely more rare with a combination franking than normal? If so, you need to be on the alert. 
Um, checking the tie to the envelope is probably the most important thing uh, when it comes to covers. Um, when we say tie, what we mean is, does the postmark overlap? If there's any change in the color of the postmark from the stamp to the envelope, it's a huge warning sign. Uh, and another top tip for covers uh, actually is to hold it up to the light. I've actually seen a, a Gandhi, uh, and when I say hold it up to the light, um, open it up and shine a light through the stamps and the envelope. Um, the reason I say that is because I've seen a Gandhi 1948 India first day cover uh, where the Gandhi 10 rupee, the key stamp, had a hinge on the back of it. So someone had thought that's not worth very much of the hinge stamp. Um, it had been added to a cover and had a fake postmark applied. And when you shine a light through, uh, obviously you're not always going to get as lucky as well or unlucky, depending on your perspective, to find a hinge. Um, but changes in adhesive, um, if there's any um, disturbance to the paper, it's a big warning sign and it needs to be properly checked out. Um, so again, we'll look at some examples. Uh, so here is a uprated cover. Um, now the first warning sign is the, the India half hour postcard is hugely rare. Uh, combination frankings uh, in Kishingar state are very rare. So again, at a glance, this seems to be a plausible cover. Um, but the more you look at it, the more you realize that the tie is completely contrived. Uh, and the kitchen gas stamp does not belong at all. Um, so I'll let you just have a quick look at it before we zoom in on it. Now, when you zoom in, this is precisely what I mean about the color changing. So if you follow the uh, edge of the postmark from the right edge where it says kitchen gar, follow it in onto the quarter anna stamp, you can see it changes from deep black to gray when it's on the stamp. Likewise, with this barred bit at the side, if you follow up from the bottom, thick black, and then once it goes onto the kitchen gas state, it's grey. And that's probably been done with, uh, it's actually probably been done with pencil in this case. Um, on the left hand side of this image, if you follow that ink round, you can see at the top the way the ink sits, and this is proper postmark ink on the left. The tie has then been contrived onto the stamp, and there you can see that the stamp, the, uh, the ink line gets thick thicker and blacker. Um, so it actually doesn't belong at all. Um, and it's, it's an entirely faked uh, cover and an entirely faked franking. Um, it's probably um, it's probably just gone from Kishingar as a normal half anna rate or maybe an uprated with an India stamp. We'll never know now it's been doctored. Um, but it's a great example of the something that doesn't belong. Uh, something that's been doctored, changed, faked, essentially, uh, to fool the collector. Uh, this is one of my favourites. Uh, this cover on the face of it um, looks lovely. Um, it came in a, an enormous Faulkner's collection I purchased a couple of years ago. Um, I'll let you uh, drink it in a bit before I, before I reveal. Um, now, I'll say, I'll say on this one, there is a huge, entirely non-philatelic clue um as to why this uh, cover is fake so it's dated 1920 um and you don't need to be a stamp specialist to work out why it's a fake when you realize it's dated 1920. um so while i let that sink in and the big clue um i'll tell you that this registration label um was not actually issued until 1935. you can see the postmarks um dated 1920. Um, so this entire cover is contrived. Uh, the stamps don't belong, the postmark is fake. Um, and the key non-philatelic clue uh, is actually the address. The address is written in Biro. Uh, and Laszlo Biro first patented the Biro pen in 1938. So not only does this cover predate the registration label um, by 15 years, it predates the invention of the pen that's written in the address by 18 years. Um, so if you saw this in a lot, uh, on the face of it, uh, it would look very appealing. It's a very neat cover, but it's designed to be a very neat cover. Um, it's just been someone uh, in terms of a faker who's not, who's not really thought it through or not really had the reference um, when, it come, when it comes to the address label. Um, but again, to the uninformed, um, it's very, very dangerous. And again, it comes down to making sure you have the reference. The reason I know that label is issued in 1935 is because I have the Heights catalog, uh, which lists all the labels. So 
uh, the theme throughout all of this uh, will always be have the reference, um, always invest in it. You know, a book might be expensive. It might cost you 80 or 100 pounds uh, if it's a niche area. It's always worth it because it can save you, if you're taking it very seriously, it can save you thousands. Um, so it's always worth investing in the reference. Um, we're getting on to the stage of the presentation now of what I'm going to term scary stuff. Um, so we're now getting into sort of surgical precision and the really, really dangerous ones. So we've covered the sort of um, most commonly made mistakes. Uh, and now we're on to the ones where luckily uh, these are actually quite rare um, that you find them. So the Falcon stamp on the right um, has, has, a, has a dirty secret, shall we say. Um, and uh, it is just about visible in the scan, but you have to have a real eagle eye, a real eagle eye. So this is a scan front and back. Uh, again, hard to see on a PowerPoint, but the watermark is inverted for this stamp. Um, so this is, uh, to all intents and purposes, you can just make out on the back scan of the stamp uh, that the crown is uh, um, inverted. Uh, so this is uh, purporting to be SG, uh, I'm just going to get the SG number, uh, SG 64AW, which catalogues £1,100. Now, a normal stamp, the normal sixpence, uh, catalogues £15. So straight away, you've got the motivation. Um, now, what we're looking at here, that's the front of the back scan of the item. What we're looking at here is actually two stamps. Now, what's happened is that someone has spliced in half two stamps and put them together to make give the appearance that the watermark is inverted. So we're actually looking at two stamps stuck together. So when you handle this stamp, it's actually too thick. Is the first clue. It doesn't ring. It doesn't uh, doesn't bend as it should. Uh, and actually, if you the reason we put this super high risk scanner for the purse is if you look up on the left hand edge uh, and go up two, you can see just behind is a trace of the second stamp. The other big clue here is you can see a lot of places along these purse. If you follow that bottom line across, there's real irregularities in the purse. Now this is where they've been recut to hide the paper behind. This so we're talking real almost microsurgery on this time to give the appearance of an inverted watermark. Uh, so when we go back, um, you're looking, you are basically looking at two stamps stuck back to back, but inverted like that. Um, and when you go back to the main image, it looks plausible. It's only when you handle it. Um, you might be suspicious of the gum, uh, but maybe not the watermark, but you always need to be aware with even something like an inverted watermark, you think, how could that be faked? Um, it can be done, uh, and that's why um, it's sensible to, you know, as always, get a guarantee, get an extension on things like this. Uh, so those, take another look at those recut perps. Um, next up is imperfect pairs. Now this is the other thing which isn't in the standard of this reference collection, but this um, uh, this is this is a great forgery and one of my favourites. Um, so this is Cyprus. This is actually one three three A. Uh, which catalogs thirty-two thousand pounds, an imperfect between pair. Um, this was offered at auction as the only known example. Um, now, massive rarity. Um, it looks, at a glance, um, to be entirely genuine. Uh, now, the clues uh, to really look for, uh, and that this is a fake. So, when you when you held it up to the light. It's very difficult to see. Uh, there's no visible seam to the naked eye or even under magnification. Uh, this is two stamps literally um, almost surgically joined together, uh, spliced, uh, and then been blanked out. The person in the middle have been blanked out um, almost perfectly. Um, so you'd think if you go to all that effort to join these two stamps imperceptibly in the middle, you've then got to fake a postmark on it. And you would think you would do a much better job than this. And I know this isn't, I, ha, I, I couldn't get a scan of this uh, in higher res, uh, but the one genuine example known is cancelled at Limassol, which is a town in Cyprus. Uh, this pair is cancelled in Imasoli, which is a completely fictional place. And I presume it's somewhere that the forger thought um, was where the other one was cancelled. Um, the other clue is if you look at the lower stamp, uh, follow the country frame from Cyprus to the right, you can see some irregularities in the perch. There is a huge perch 
uh, or a huge puff hole, I should say, uh, and, uh, if you follow that edge on the lower right of this image. Um, now, obviously, with a, a normal perf stamp, that, would, that wouldn't happen. So that's a huge clue. Uh, the perfs were wrong, but again, this was a hugely, uh, hugely impressive uh, forgery just because the scene was virtually invisible. Um, but fortunately, um, it went to the BPI on extension, uh, received the pink certificate, and um, again, it, it won't be sold as a genuine stamp again. Um, this is another example of this, uh, this, this completely fake and perfect pair. So this would be um, the only known of this stamp, Georgia Sick. It's an imperfect between pair. Now, the reason I've shown this one is because it's particularly clever, because if you look at the lower image, the crown that's purporting to be the watermark actually goes across the margin, um, which is very, very clever. Uh, I'm not actually sure how they've done it. Um, but again, this is just two normal stamps, which have been very, very uh, finely uh, spliced together, joined together completely fraudulently. Um, and actually in this case, to create a stamp that, that doesn't exist, um, which is an imperf, imperf between. Uh, we list a vertical pair, um, not a horizontal pair, but um, we've, we've not seen one for many, many years. So uh, again, this, this is housed in the reference collection. It is a complete fake. Uh, the more you examine it, um, the, the worse it gets. But on again, on, a, on an initial impression, um, this, is, this is really quite an impressive forgery. Um, we get now to the Salon School. Now, the Salon School is so named. Um, I'll, actually, I'll come, I'll come back to that. Um, fun, fundamentally, um, these stamps look genuine. Um, the paper is genuine, the perforations are genuine, the watermark is genuine, and the cancel is genuine. This is what makes these so incredibly dangerous. Now, the biggest clue for these salon school forgeries is where they're cancelled. So you have this straight settlement stamp, $5. Um, Castles, I think, £350 off the top of my head. Um, that stamp's actually, that's a partial Tortola cancellation, uh, which is actually in the British Virgin Islands. So why would a straight settlement stamp be cancelled in the British Virgin Islands? As it gets even worse when you get to Zululand, again, you've got a partial, partial CDS, Zululand in Southern Africa. That is even worse. That's Amoy on the south coast of China. So what you have there is a straight settlement stamp cancelled in Tortola and a Zululand stamp cancelled in Amoy. Big, big, big warning sign. Virtually impossible, but not entirely impossible in saying. Um, now, the reason these are called the Salon, um, Salon School is because these are often post, um, found with Salon postmarks. Um, and this is actually the method that Sperati used. So you get a genuine stamp with a genuine cancellation, you get the genuine purse, you get the genuine watermark. You then bleach off the design. This is what makes these so genuine. And then you print the design on top of the postmark. So these stamps have been completely bleached off. The straight settlements would have started life as a uh, British Virgin Islands stamp, uh, and the Zululand would have started life as a Hong Kong stamp, uh, almost certainly. They've then been completely bleached off and had another design printed on. Um, and again, these are, these are hugely high quality, but the biggest clue for these is um, that they're, they're always postmarked in the wrong place. Um, the forger is basically relying on the fact that people won't know that that says Tortola, they won't notice that that says Amoy. Or it doesn't match it. So again, we're down to you need to have the reference. If you collect new stamps, you need to know what cancels were in use in Zululand at the time, what cancels were in straight settlements at the time. And also the broader your knowledge, the better. Because as soon as you see Tortola on a straight settlement stamp, you straight away need to be thinking, why would a five dollar straight settlement stamp be cancelled in Tortola? So these are usually dangerous. So I've 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 kind of doctored these images so you can see it better. So ignore ignore the colour. Uh, because the, the red paper is actually correct. Uh, these were scanned at completely different times, and the Zululand uh, five, the genuine five pound on the left has been long sold. So I had to work with a very old scan here. Um, this shows you the sheer quality of the fake that we're looking at here. So on the right, fundamentally a Hong Kong stamp cancelled in Amoy. And then it's al almost definitely with uh, Photo Lipo as a process. Um, had a new design, the New Zealand design, uh, printed on to the old Hong Kong stamp, or that you, you end up with a 
Once you've bleached off the design, you end up with a blank piece of paper with correct watermark perfs and a postmark on it. Um, now, the key here uh, that shows the Zulu land forgery is the Zulu land uh, country inscription is very slightly too short. You can see if you compare the two value tablets, it's slightly too short. Uh, and then in the scrolls underneath the P of postage and the E of revenue, you can see in the forgery, they're a lot thicker. Uh, and in the genuine on the left hand side, they're very fine uh, and basically a lot better done. Um, but again, if you go back and look at that Zulu land and you saw it in a collection and you didn't know the Zulu land cancellations, these are, these are super, super dangerous um, stamps. And uh, luckily, um, the salon school wasn't wasn't that prolific, so we don't we don't actually have many of these in our collection. But if you ever see uh, a Commonwealth rarity cancelled somewhere that's ninety nine point nine percent impossible, um, you straight away need to start thinking. Actually, I need an extension on this. I need a certificate on this. Um, we need to get this checked out. Um, so there we go. Um, so that pretty that's that pretty much sums it up. So I'll run through the golden rules of what we've covered. Fundamentally, always be on the alert. The stamps in this presentation catalogue from eight pounds for the Regum Grenada to 32,000 pounds. So whether you're extreme top end collector or whether you're collecting unmounted mint jewels, jewels of fifth, um, you need to be super careful and you need to know your onions. The biggest thing to take away from this is that wherever there's an opportunity for deception, easy or not, it's highly likely someone in history has tried it and you need to be on the lookout for it. Um, the good news is that there are processes within the trade for doing this. So either buy with a guarantee, or if it's at an auction, ask for a certificate or an extension. Um, and make sure it's a certificate um, that, suits, that suits your country. Uh, so for Commonwealth standing, it is always recommended for BPA. Um, the reason this is underlined is because if it looks too good to be true, it almost definitely is. So when we go back to those chamber cancels, uh, 42 pounds to 900 pounds. You've got those sort of weedy impressions. If it looks too good to be true, you need to start thinking that's probably not going to be good. And then the last, the last piece of advice that I'd massively recommend is that invest in your library, invest in your knowledge. Uh, knowledge not only protects you from buying these, um, but it's, it's a double-edged sword because not only does it protect you from buying these, but it allows you to spot bargains as well. So invest in the literature. I know people say, oh, you know, that book's 80 quid, I don't want it. Or, you know, small run philatelic books are expensive to produce. Um, but actually, if they save you buying one bad stamp for a few hundred pounds, they're always, always, always worth having. Um, so, yeah, I, I hope that really helped. Um, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Um, and, yeah, if, any, if anyone's got any questions, I'd be, I'd be glad, to, glad to try and help. George, that was fantastic. There's one question uh, waiting here for you that I think is a really good question. Actually, I, I perked up when I saw this one. Uh, someone yeah. said, in your opinion, have forgeries become easier to spot, for example, due to the availability of online information and other resources, or has the development of technology made the production of good forgeries easier? So in sort of this arms race between forgeries and detecting forgeries, uh, how, how would you compare the situation today versus even 10 or 20 years ago? Um, a lot of the, a lot of the really nasty clever ones you saw, so like the salon school ones, the imperfect pairs, um, the people that used to produce those, um, are, as far as I'm aware, um, not around anymore. So the kind of people that are able to produce those, um, I'm not aware of any modern ones being produced. The flip side of that is when you talk of technology in terms of, uh, postmarks. Um, it's become much easier uh, to fake postmarks over time when you think of modern design tools, uh, modern printers. Um, you know, it, so there are some things where it's become easier, there are some things where it's become much harder. Um, the key reason overall it's become much harder um, is the fact that when you look at, take the Man and Joseph's, it was massively rife in the 40s, 50s, 60s because no one knew what was out there. Um, the depth of research that's been done on these stamps, most of the stamps we looked at there are almost, a, almost without exception 100 years old. In the last 100 years, that literature has been published, that literature is out there and available, and often 
there are fantastic web resources, as, as, um, as, the, as the gentleman said, um, which are doing. So just use the literature. The research, nothing makes uh, nothing makes it more difficult for forgers to operate than knowledge, um, and that that's where there you know that's where philately is winning the arms race nowadays. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. We have another question here. Uh, from a gentleman, does Stanley Gibbons have any non-Commonwealth forgeries, for example, Persia, in their reference collection? Yeah, so the original, um, the original uh, world reference, we call it, um, or foreign reference, uh, is, is still housed in the vault. Um, it's that we periodic display, we have a viewing gallery, uh, 399 Strand, and we periodically display uh, sections of it. Um, the only problem is with the uh, foreign records collection is that in the 80s, the foreign, uh, the foreign department of Stanley Gibbons um, was downsized a little bit and some of the things were, the collections remained but some of the key really expensive items were disposed of in the 80s, um, but it remains, it remains an incredible work, it has the original handwriting of, um, you know, Major Evans, um, it has correspondence with postmasters way back in the, you know, 1910s, 1920s. So there's still an absolute wealth of uh, reference material in the Stanley Evans reference collection for foreign markets. Someone asks, is collecting forgeries popular? I know there's certain artists like Sparati or Fournier who are, who are quite popular, but overall, do you get many people who are, are searching for these things for what they are? Uh, less so now. It had a, I would say it had a peak probably about five or 10 years ago um but they, they are widely collected uh, the particularly uh i mean i didn't cover sparati much because i think most people viewing will know the story of sparati um i didn't, I didn't want to go over old ground but purely because of the artistry that went into those uh, how impressive they were um you know any sort of engraved forgery any skillful forgery is still popular um today and in many cases they're actually worth more than normal stamps people i know try and collect all the matter those cancellations um now the reference is out there um brian cartwright actually um I, I don't know his exact um grade but he won a very very good medal um exhibiting collections of madame joseph forgeries and he won a research medal as well um so i'd say it, it seems to have peaked slightly but people definitely do uh, collect these um but we it, where they're really dangerous and they could be re-offered as genuine, we always try and take them off the market. Great, thank you. Uh, another one, can people, if they come across a forgery that, that that's either returned to them from a fake certificate or anything, can they donate these to Stanley Gibbons for their reference collection? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, we add to it, um, we, we add to it all the time and yeah, any anything like that would be, um, massively grateful, gratefully received. And we, we try, uh, when we discovered the uh, Amoy forgery, the Zululand, for example, we wrote it up in the, the monthly journal, um, in the magazine, we try and get this, you know, we do talks like this, we try and spread the word as much as we possibly can. Um, so in many ways, um, if you do find a dangerous forgery, there's no better home for it because you know it won't get sold again, it takes off the market and equally, um, we pretty much do everything we can to get, to get the word out and make sure that, you know, no one else can be fooled in the same way. And, and then I, I know we've got to wrap up here in a minute, but, but one last question that came in, sure. somebody asked what you're, and, and I think this is more of a uh, continental Europe uh, versus, versus uh, the UK and the U S but somebody asked what your view on expertising marks on stamps is. And if there are any examples of uh, forged expertising marks. Uh, I have seen examples of fake exercise and marks. Um, it, it is it is uh, it is known in in Commonwealth as well. Um, I've seen. Uh, I won't I won't give um, specifics because it won't mean anything. But basically, fakes of uh, expertising marks do exist. Um, again, because they're fakeable, the more the more reliable the expertising mark. Um, the <laughs> the more motivation there is for a forger to try it, but there, there are there are many that are massively massively reliable. Uh, Hoopzama is a good one, um, who did a lot of the um, overprints. That it's just one example. There are there are some very very reliable ones, but they're not on their own enough um, 
you know they're not on their own enough owners marks can be better uh, so you get the uh, Marquis of Butte uh, that's a very good mark to get on the back uh, Emir of Baja Walpur had his own own mark that that is good for provenance but in terms of uh, proof of authenticity I I wouldn't rely on it alone is my advice always get an appropriate certificate well, George, this has been fantastic. Uh, I, I think we're getting a couple of uh, comments, people saying it was well worth uh, staying up late for, uh, even though Michael and I didn't have to <laughs> deal with that ourselves. We got lucky on this one, but uh, this this was fascinating for, for uh, you know us personally and I'm sure everyone else who was uh, tuning in. So thank you very much for this. This was a, a really great night. That's great. Thank you. No, it's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. And I'm, uh, yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad people enjoyed it. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you to like everyone uh, watching. And uh, thank you, George. And uh, enjoy the rest of your virtual Stamp X. Thank you. You guys too. Thanks.